Okay, so here we have the chapter four example. Uh, I've opened up the A star example. So we have the A star nav mesh and path following examples. Um, let's go into path following first. So we have obstacle avoidance. Uh, and so we have a simple setup here with a few different um, obstacles there. And then we have this little green agent, which has an avoidance script. And an important thing to note in this example is that these cubes, um, all have uh, colliders and so we have our agent here let's uh, take a look at the avoidance script so we're setting some uh, serialized fields here and then some private fields you can tweak these to sort of change the behavior um, let's start it up and run it so it says click anywhere to move the agent there uh, it has a default position that it'll go to but here if you click it'll do it and you see it'll navigate around the obstacles everything's working as intended uh, so if we look here at the code uh, we initialize some values and then on update we're checking for input. Check for input is basically doing what we did in the previous chapter which is if we click the mouse button it's going to shoot array and update the target position that we're going to. Uh, once we check the input uh, we get the direction and then we apply the avoidance to it. Uh, avoidance is going to basically check through um, a, it's going to shoot a raycast and then check if there's anything in the way there and it's going to try to avoid it by offsetting um, the position uh, the direction it's going in based on uh, the ne the normal of the of the uh, object that we hit. Um, layer mask here is an example we cover in the book. Essentially because we have the obstacles on a particular layer oops, um, the obstacles layer here which is number eight uh, we bit shift um, this layer mask int by eight spots to get to that which is actually um, spot number nine uh, because it's a zero index and so that gives us our layer mask which we use here so it's going to hit everything it's only going to hit anything marked as obstacle so if there's anything else there that's not marked obstacle it's not going to hit it okay so once we apply the avoidance then we check if we're within the tolerance radius same as we did before in the previous example if you're close enough essentially which uh, we're saying is if you're within three units then return we're done uh, if we're not then we uh, move towards the target like we did with the tank example uh, we update the look rotation using S, uh, spherical lerp and uh, we interpolate towards it and we move forward. So that's the result of what you're seeing here with um, this click to move behavior. It'll eventually make its way down to there. Okay, so that's the first example in chapter four. Um, these instructions is just the UI element. Uh, so let's look at path following. Uh, path following is essentially going to uh, allow you to set a number of nodes and draw a path between those and then this agent is going to move between those uh, different nodes. So you only see this in the editor view because it's a debug line but you'll notice here in scene view it's moving and it's starting the process over. So there are a few uh, scripts here that do that. First is the path. Let's look at that. It allows us to set these points manually uh, alternatively, of course, uh, I suggest to the reader in the book that you could, uh, instead of using these manually typed in positions, which are a little bit unwieldy, is that you could instead replace this uh, to use markers like t uh, transforms, an array of transforms, and then grab their positions. So that way you can manually move the points in the scene. Uh, but this code here just illustrates the concept, so uh, it'll get the job done. Essentially, we're going to get the array of waypoints, and then we're going to get, uh, we're going to run through it, every waypoint and then we're going to draw a line between it and the previous line so in this case this one this one to this one this one to this one so on and so forth and that's just drawing the path the actual movement happens in the pathing script on the agent so again we're setting some public uh, serialized uh, variables that are private and then some internal variables we initialize some stuff here and essentially uh, we check for a path just do a simple null check and we update our current speed um, by multiplying by delta time and then we check if the target is reached, um, then we set, uh, uh, we set the next target. Um, and then move again as we have in the past. Uh, although this is slightly different, we use a steer, um, a steer uh, method here. Um, so setting next target is basically checking through. If you've reached the end and it's a looping, um, you have looping turned on right here, then it's just going to go back to the very beginning. So here it sets if looping 
it's going to set the current path to the zero index, which is the first one, and it's going to say success true. Um, and then here we're going to basically keep moving through uh, in a circle. If I have that turned off, as opposed to the first time, you'll notice it'll reach the end, and that'll be that. And there it stops. Whereas if you have looping, it'll go all the way around. Um, it's fairly straightforward stuff here. And this is how we do pathfinding using uh, a simple uh, waypoint system. Uh, now we have something a little bit more complicated, which is the A-star system. Um, not save that. So the A-star system does a few things. In this scene, we have some obstacles as well. We have this grid that gets drawn using a grid manager under the scripts game object. Uh, here it allows us to set some uh, variables, the number of rows, columns, the cell size, whether or not to show the grid, and obstacle blocks. And you notice the grid manager uh, is like a collection of helper methods, but it's actually also setting up nodes for you. So it's actually representing the data of this grid as well as visualizing it. So we initialize our nodes given the number of columns and rows that we specified and using a nested for loop, so a 2D, uh, going through a 2D array, we generate these nodes. We calculate our obstacles, uh, and then we provide some helpers. We can get the grid, uh, the cell center, so it'll actually get the center position of each uh, node, right? Um, and then we'll be able to get the grid index based on a position. So if I give it a position of here, it's gonna tell me which node number that is, row and column. And here in, uh, we can get the row of the index, so we give it an index. So we say like, uh, this index here is going to tell me that it's row number, whatever that is, three or four. Um, and conversely, we can give it, uh, we get the column, and we can also check if it's in bounds. Um, we have a little helper here to get the neighbors of a node, uh, the four cardinal positions, uh, up, down, left, right. And then we have, uh, we can assign the neighbor. And then we have the draw that gives most stuff. So this will draw our grid as show grid is turned on. And it'll call this method to draw our, our grid. Um, and finally, we'll show obstacle blocks. Again, if that's turned on, it'll draw that. OK, so what does this do? If we hit play, it's going to draw a line between our starting node and our end node. Now, you notice here we use, um, actually, it's not in this class, uh, but in the test A star, we have a test interval time. And so this is so that it doesn't run on update. It just runs every n number of seconds in this case. In this case, we set it to one. So when I move this, it updates, but it does take a second. Um, and that's just for performance reasons. Um, so let's take a look at that test A star class. So this is kind of like the bootstrap part. It sets up our test uh, environment. Uh, we have some private methods here that we set, a start node and an end node which um, we get using the start and end uh, labels on it. So if we have our start node here, it has a start tag and, and has an end tag. Of course, you can assign these manually or whatever you want to do. In this case, we just use find game object with tag for simplicity. Uh, and then we find a path. If, we're with, if we pass the, elapse, uh, the interval time that we're looking for, it'll try to find the path again. And find a path essentially gets the start node, end node and then does a start that find path. So um, before we get into that, this last method here just draws the path uh, as a line. Uh, so let's look at the a star method, or class, sorry. So the a star class does all the heavy lifting. So the actual a star algorithm is implemented via this one method here, uh, all the way through here actually. And so it is a, a bit of a recursive uh, method here. Um, we run through the grid. Um, let's see, if we don't have a grid, we return, but we have the grid. Uh, we create an open list here. Essentially, as long as there are open, um, i.e. unvisited nodes, um, so if it's not zero, uh, then we get the first node. And then we run through it. We go through each of the neighbors, and we check the neighbors. And if it's uh, not in the closed list, we go ahead and run through it, check the cost. And, uh, and then we move it into uh, the closed list. We push that node. Um, then we remove it from the open list. Um, so if you read the chapter, you'll see exactly what these, these, this terminology means. But essentially, the open list, uh, we track all the ones that we haven't visited. And once we've visited them, we add them to the closed list so that we don't visit them twice 
which is why we check uh, if this closed list here, make sure that it's not in there. Um, and then we return uh, this calculate path method, which is, um, let's see, calculate path. Oh, yeah, it's the one I have selected here. So calculate path then gives you back um, the, the list in reverse. So essentially like from the end to the start. Um, and that's essentially it. So this one definitely requires reading the chapter to understand. If you don't know A star, um, you're going to have to re read the chapter and um, familiarize yourself because it's not necessarily about the Im implementation itself, but the concept and the algorithm, which is a fairly straightforward concept, but it does have a few moving parts. So um, this is just how you test the scene and everything's kind of set up for you and you can move this around. And if you want to dig in, uh, the code's right there. The last part, uh, this is kind of the longest chapter, is we have nav mesh, which then builds on it. Uh, we have this nav mesh uh, scene here. And so in this scene, we set up an environment that kind of has a few different things that we test. Um, and so the examples in the book walk us through doing a few different things. But you'll notice here, if I select the navigation tab uh, slash window, uh, it'll show me the navigation path that has been created. And so there's a few things that the chapter will ask you to do. So first, we'll notice that uh, if I click to move, as it says here, it'll update this marker position and move my agent to that position. I move up this ramp, everything's fine. And then I move up this ramp again, everything's fine. In the book, uh, the user is prompted to update the uh, slope height, um, which will make it so that you can't reach this spot. The other thing that uh, you actually are prompted to change in the book uh, to follow the example is these off mesh links. So there are a few different ways to do these. Um, so here they're already generated, auto generated, so it'll jump. But if you try to go to this location, it can't do it. And so the way you follow the example is that you create these off mesh links. So you can create a, a little 3D object, a sphere, for example. Oops. Uh, it's a little confusing here in 3D. So these are essentially uh, markers for where the off mesh links will be. So, oops. Sorry about that. And we'll move it up here, move it here. There's a component you gotta add to it, which is uh, off mesh, mesh link. Um, and then we duplicate that, move that here. Um, and so we can sort of add this reference to the start, and add this reference to end. And then when I have my navigation view on, you'll see that the nav mesh link is created. Kind of like these are auto generated, then these are manually generated. So when I run this, I can jump from one to the other. Uh, so we'll update our tank. It's going to run up there. And jump here. And then I do this one. It jumps over that off mesh link and back. And so that's basically the example here. As far as the code goes, it's pretty straightforward uh, because we're showcasing that Unity has these feature features built in. Uh, so we have a target. Um, component here very similar to what we've used in the past essentially when you click on a position shoots array updates the position of the marker and gives you a new position it'll draw a line to that position as well so you notice here in debug view there's a little red line emanating from here uh, that's just a debug view thing uh, and then the tank itself has an ab mesh agent um, these are the tarot components and uh, there was one more, actually, I believe this, yeah, okay, so everything's actually in the target um, setup. So the target setup also gives the nav mesh agent, which it finds using a uh, finds object of type, uh, it, gives, it updates their, uh, their destination. So Unity, by uh, providing this destination position, it'll automatically find the path for you. And so that's what we're highlighting in this example. Uh, and that's it for this chapter. Chapter 4 is a little bit on the longer side, so there are a few examples.